All right, team, this is OCA checking in. Let's address the obvious first. I know I have been silent for some time, but I was busy with Sonic crafting while you were enjoying the festive season. The result, well, I believe it was worth the effort, and I'm not talking about your run-of-the-mill EQ tricks here. This is sort of next level, folks. Speaking of holidays, I want to express my gratitude for the avalanche of super tanks that rained down on the channel during the festive season. It was truly heartwarming. Now on to the main topic. Introducing a new inversion technique today, it's simple, quick and produces remarkably better results than the quite popular inversion method I have introduced about a year ago. Here are some before and after comparisons for the 19% of you out there who skipped my videos in the first 6 seconds. Frequency graph. Original versus final. Left speaker. Waterfall. Original versus final. And spectrogram. Original versus final. And some overlays. Phase original versus final. Actually, better use cycloacoustic smoothing. Final. Impulse, final versus original, ETC graph, step graph, group delay, zero axis, RT60, and musical clarity. Before I dive into the steps of the method, I want to clarify a few technical aspects. Firstly, the correction is only applied below Schroeder's aka room transient frequency or in simplified terms the bass response. This sets it apart from automated calibration systems like Dirac Live and Odyssey which attempt to correct the entire frequency range which in my opinion is a major flaw. Typically, frequency response at listening locations in a room is measured with an omnidirectional microphone and then adjusted to match a predetermined target curve. Contrary to popular belief, imperfections of both the speakers and the rooms cannot be reliably captured by this method, let alone be reliably corrected. It's a tempting marketing story, but it's not an accurate anticipation of the human response to a very complex sound field. A commonly raised argument regarding the wavelength of high frequency sound waves, which can be as short as 1.7 cm for the still audible 20,000 Hz, suggests that the measured room response at the listening position cannot be maintained consistent in relation to minor head movements, and that's quite true. However, even in the absurd absence of even the smallest head movement, achieving accurate equalization of the high frequency response to a desired shape will yield subpar results at best. Firstly, the direction of the reflected sound cannot be measured accurately with an omnidirectional microphone. These high frequency beams exhibit strong directionality, influenced not only by speaker directivity but also by all of the room's reflective surfaces based on their size, shape and absorption coefficient which also vary with the reflection angle and the beam frequency. Multiple sound vectors interact with each other to create a sound field, timing and energy content of which we have not enough information about. Moreover, the human brain is evolved to respond to these directional cues in detail and it can distinguish room sound from loudspeaker timbral identity. There is evidence that in small to medium sized rooms especially, most people find multi-directional reflected sounds quite benign and some even prefer that especially if the loudspeaker has constant directivity. There are also recent studies which show some early reflections can improve speech intelligibility, which is also crucial for music. Hardcore room treatment fans should take a note of this. We can use gated windowing techniques to filter timing fluctuations of these beams to an extent, but the directional information will always be missing, so most attempts to change the diffusive sound field in these areas will carry a high risk of causing an otherwise good speaker sound bad. RWS sophisticated tools that can graph peak energy times of frequencies as spectrograms, and if you have really bad speakers, with uneven direct sound and very poor directivity, trying to correct high frequency response might make some sense, but good luck with the sheer complexity of that and achieving a valid calibration in a reasonable area around the LP. Now you may wonder, how can we correct for frequencies below the room transient then? 
Well, most speakers today are designed to provide a flat frequency response in the direct sound. That's the sound that reaches our ears first before any reflection does. This direct sound will be manipulated by room reflections all along the frequency band shortly after. But bass wavelengths are much larger than the speaker drivers which produce them, i.e. 1.7 meters for 200 Hz, making them truly omnidirectional with no directivity. So an omnidirectional measurement microphone can precisely capture the total sound pressure of these long waves at a single point in the room. Minimum phase infinite impulse response filters are reliably effective at removing this added pressure from these waves. Now you might ask, why not just use auto EQ filters below Schroeder's frequency? Well, absolutely do. With the click of a button, REW will generate optimized IIR filters for your measured bass response in a couple of seconds, and it will usually get you 80-90% of the way there to optimal correction. There is not a single system in the world which will not benefit from a 20Hz to 200Hz auto EQ with 0dB boost targeted to the same level for each of the left and right speakers and if you're not doing this, your ears are suffering a lot of bass peaks raining into the mids and highs muddying your music. But you can do even better with a little bit of more effort. For a given frequency response, there are many different possible phase responses. And all of these can be causal and stable, but there is only one minimum phase version, and only this one is invertible, meaning it has a stable and causal inverse. In z-plane terms, a minimum phase system is characterized by having all poles and zeros inside the unit circle. For a causal system to be stable, all poles must reside inside the unit circle. In this regard, maximum and mixed phase systems are also stable. However, when you invert a system, the poles become zeros and the zeros become poles. Therefore, only a causal minimum phase system has a stable causal inverse as other systems have zeros outside the unit circle leading to instability upon inversion. By the way, there is no truly maximum phase system because that means infinite time delay. That's why you don't hear the term very often. Z-plane, unit circle and pole zero jargon might have turned some of you off already, so let me try to explain in human language. It's just a fancy term for a simple concept, a well-behaved system that responds predictably to your input so it's easy to control its output. That's minimum phase. A non-minimum phase system refers to systems that are difficult to control due to a process lag or a time delay or an inverse response characteristic where the process will initially move in the opposite direction of its final response. These processes tend to be difficult to control because there is a time lag, phase delay in acoustic terms, between the time the control action is applied and the time the effect of that control action is observed. For the inverse response systems, that effect is even worse because the larger the initial control action, the more the output will move in the opposite direction you ultimately want to go. Typical non-minimum phase system examples, for example steering a bicycle. When you steer a bicycle, the handlebars are the input and the resulting motion of the bicycle is the output. The non-minimum phase behavior is primarily attributed to the geometry of the bicycle and the way the rider interacts with it. Trail, as it's called, is the distance between the point where the front wheel contacts the ground and the point where the steering axis intersects the ground. Positive trail is embedded in bicycle designs to increase stability, but this causes an initial delay before the bike responds by turning in the opposite direction when the handlebars are turned. This delay and subsequent reversal of the direction both result in non-minimum phase behavior of the bicycle. Reverse parking, for example, is another similarly non-minimum phase phenomenon because it first requires an opposite movement. By the same token, a financial investment involves a time delay between the input when you invest your money and the output when you receive your initial capital plus the interest back. Because you pay for the investment upfront, it has an initial effect in the opposite direction as well, so it's non-minimum phase. Human digestion, in terms of obtaining energy from food, also is non-minimum phase because it has a reverse initial effect and a time delay between the input and the output. All these systems have one more thing in common. They are hard to control. We will all remember it took a lot of practice when we were kids to learn to ride a bike because it involves making regular opposite steering inputs against our intuition. Reverse parking is difficult, making money in the financial markets is also not easy, keeping your food intake in control as well notoriously tough, so is controlling the speaker response at the listening position as long as it's not minimum phase. So we need to convert it to minimum phase to be able to gain control over the frequency response. That requires removing the maximum possible delay from that response while keeping it causal and REW can do that with the click of a button. Upon obtaining the minimum phase version of the speaker response at the LP and in the pursuit of the true inverse filter to equalize the speaker response, we inverted all the way up to the room transient frequency. 
All non-invertible excess phase has already been eliminated from the response before the inversion and the filter will correct as much frequency magnitude and as much excess phase as mathematically possible while still maintaining stability. The magnitude response of the inversion will be very similar to the optimized IIR filters over a flat target, but the phase response will be different. The frequency magnitude filters will be applied at the best possible time, in other words, with the correct phase without causing any artifacts. With minimum phase IIR filters, there is always an unremoved excess phase left and it's very difficult to robustly remove it without artifacts. Even the best software tools like Accurate and Audio Lens only make roughly estimated attempts to partially remove it without causing pre-echo. Think of it as uh, converting a bond investing to a minimum phase system by purchasing a put option along with the bond. Now it's reversible with just a small loss of option premium. And with the correct timing of the reversal, i.e. inversion filters, you can even make a lot of money. You can also sell the bond without the minimum phase conversion by selling the correct number of bonds, i.e. minimum phase IIR filters, but you will not guarantee correct timing. Now that all this explanation is out of the way, let's delve into the actual creation of the filters. Here is my left speaker average measurement. As you see, it's a vector average of L1, L3, L5, L7. Some of them are eliminated for the averaging due to higher distortion than the others. These are all taken at the same exact central microphone position. I don't suggest taking measurements around the LP and average them with cross correlation. Base response doesn't really change that much and you will have better uniformity but you will lose some precision at the central listening position. Precise calibration at the center helps also around the center to an extent. If you are desperate about uniform base response in a larger area, get more subwoofers. And by the same token, you don't need very expensive microphones because most of them are accurate in this area, base region where we will do the only correction. But don't forget to create a minimum phase version of your microphone calibration file as explained in previous videos. It's quite important for the phase response inversion. And Right speaker also is an average of various measurements at the same central location. I measured left and right together. This M stands for measured response and LR0 is the vector average of L and R. And if you make a comparison, as you can see, they are very, very similar. In fact, if I make a psychoacoustic smoothing, you can see that they are identical. That shows that there is nothing wrong in my measurements, neither left, neither or right. So we don't need these, in fact, this is just a double check. So let's remove the smoothing. And it's very easy. Let's start from the left speaker, okay? We don't need a target here and we are not gonna make target level matching nothing you will see that both speakers will be automatically aligned to the same volume unless you have a hardware problem and one speaker is louder than the other in the origin or you're f further away from one speaker this should automatically level the volumes of the speakers so this is now a non-minimum phase response obviously okay and we will ask Rev to create minimum phase version. It is under the measurement actions menu in all SPL. When L0 is selected, you just click minimum phase version. Include calibration file effects, that's important. Nothing else is ticked and make minimum phase copy. Here is the minimum phase copy. And if we compare these two, phase responses. As you see, magnitude responses are identical. Let me show you L0 and L0 MP, completely identical. But the phase responses, when you compare, L0 and L0 MP. You will see that the minimum phase version has a very different phase response to the actual original measurement. Now as I explained before, the importance of this version is that it is invertible. 
So how do we do that? Trace arithmetic, L0, MP, minimum phase version selected, B is not important, and 1 over A. Now, regularization 25% means 0 dB boost, okay? I'm not gonna boost anything. And lower limit, none, so it starts from the very beginning, and upper limit is 225 Hz. This is not going about the Schroders, this is actually because of the calculations and FFT at the background during division. Uh, rev starts to fade out by 200 Hz if you enter 225. Okay, I optimized this trying every single frequency from 210 to 240, checking the clarity at the end, and um, in my case it's 225. In your room it might be slightly different, but you won't make a major mistake if you use the same number here. And generate. Target level is auto. We don't take exclude notches, that doesn't make a difference anyway. But as you see, I'm not even entering a target level. It will automatically calculate what the target level needs to be. And at the bottom of the screen now we have our filter already. This is it. This is the filter. I was inclined to take a minimum phase version of this filter to use it in the convolution engine, but I figured this is a lot more clearer in every way and it sounds better. And also there is no peri-echo or ringing of any kind, despite the sharp phase adjustments of this filter. Now, if you compare this filter to its minimum phase version, for example, we can do that as well. Minimum phase version 1 over 8, no calibration file effects this time, and make minimum phase copy. As you see, frequency response is identical, and phase response one over A and one over A and P. You can see that our filter has very different phase response. This is also quite a good filter, but you don't need that and this is a much better filter. This is all the magic of this method. We are already done. We have to do the same for R. And just to show you, L0 times this one over A filter this one. I delete the minimum phase version, we don't need it. By the way, the minimum phase version is quite similar to what you would get with an IIR filter with res auto EQ filters. If you just select a flat a target level there and A times B generate. As you see, it's a very level smooth response and the roll off as it should be with this speaker. This is quite similar to this speaker's anechoic response. That's what I'm guessing. And let's do the same now. Oh, I forgot one thing. Sorry. Before you do anything else, you have to remove the IR delays from the speaker measurements because you can never measure them at exactly the central location and there will always be time delays from the system. So this is your left speaker and this is your right speaker. You can see here at the end of the phase responses that there are some irregularities because they are not exactly time aligned. What you do is the simplest way, remove IR delays when two of them are selected. Look, there will be some movement in the phase here. Remove IR delays. And as you said, you might want to click this a couple of times, make sure they don't move. Now they are completely IR delays removed and then the phase reversal is gonna work better. You can also see in the impulse graphs all these two undo T0 changes. This was where they were and when you remove IR delays, this is what happened to them. Okay, here is a step response comparison of the original speaker response at the LP versus its minimum phase version. We removed the delay by removing IR delays and generated the minimum phase version, you will see that the original response, the step that is applied to this impulse is a step like this, a square, okay? And look, the non-minimum phase version makes a move in the opposite direction initially and then goes up. And with a delay, the minimum phase version is going directly up and with no delay, starting at time zero. 
That is why this is reversible. After this, you can create a minimum phase version, including calibration file effects. Do the same for R0, minimum phase version. Make minimum phase copy. I also want to show you that the calibration file I'm using has a phase response. This is the minimum phase version of the calibration file that's supplied by the microphone company. And after you remove IR delays as well and create the minimum phase version with the calibration file effects included, then you really have the minimum phase version of your speaker's response at the central listening position. And once you have these, you just invert them with trace arithmetic L0 MP1 over A. These are the settings, generate, and then R0 MP1 over A, generate. And in this stage, you're already done. All you have to do is export, import, export impulse response as wave. You can separately export them as mono or stereo files, left channel and right channel as this one. Don't make this mistake. And none of these. Apply IR windows before export. That should stay there. And 48 kHz res native sampling rate. 32 bit float for maximum precision. And let's call this inverse MP filters. That's it. Filter is already created. And now let's see what the results are going to be like. L0 times 1 over A and R0 times 1 over A. Let's call them L1 and R1. Look at L1 and R1 now. Perfectly level matched and with the natural roll off of the speakers. This is it, the LP. And I don't need to do anything to the high frequencies above Schroeder's. This will sound the best. I made all kinds of comparisons, many, many tests. I mean, if you really try, for example, what you can do to high frequencies with these speakers. Okay, I have quite good speakers, I agree. But still, no speaker can be so bad that you have to do adjustments that Dirac and Odyssey is doing to high frequencies. It's unbelievable. Um, first, let's apply window gating. Okay, my speakers are at 2 meter 44 centimeters, which is around 7.11 milliseconds direct sound to reach me. So if I cut the right window at 7.11 milliseconds without any smoothing and nothing, look what happened to my response already. Okay, this is pseudo without any reflection. In the response but this is still completely unsmoothed okay and let's try to smooth it with the ears equivalent rectangular bandwidth ERB okay which is kind of a logical smoothing and once I do the ERB okay and if you assume this is the volume limit look what I need to do to my speakers let's take everything else out this L1 okay so maybe I might need a 2.7 dB peaking filter to cut off around 1000 Hertz 900 Hertz and something that might need at 1.4 khz around 1 dB and I tried those and even these have this throttling effect on the sound because of the directivity that you can't control here you can do things about it by using wavelets You will see here at 900, if you really zoom in there, you will see some sort of delay there at this frequency. Look, this is zero axis. You don't even, or let's try with L0. Here, let's see what's going on. Okay. 
it's, we are talking about one millisecond, folks. It's, uh, so there is not much, there isn't anything that really can be done. Just don't touch this area. That's my suggestion. And do compare with different filters and you will see the difference. You will hear the difference. I still believe in listening to the system. At the end of the day, this is why we have these systems, to listen to them. And what else can I add? Okay, if you are desperate about a target shape like Harmon or uh, Dr. Tool, then you can always multiply this filter with the target right away. It will be the same. I don't need this, okay? If you want more bass, then turn on the volume and then it will sound louder to you, the bass due to human hearing, but it's possible to just multiply this filter with any curve as long as you make sure first that the target curve as, as a text file is volume adjusted. They must all be at 0 dB at 1, 1 kHz. Lastly, is wave files saved as stereo. I figured you can directly use them in JRiver. I don't know if it's an update, but you don't need to have config text files anymore with JRiver. That it can directly read WAV files, just like Rune. And also another surprise I didn't know, possibly some of you already know that. If you tick WDM driver in general features or JRiver, you can stream directly to JRiver and apply the full JRiver DSP, including Tidal and Cobos and what have you. This is almost as convenient as Rune at a fraction of the cost. Okay, so JRiver, I think, is like a master license, is like $70. And that's all the cost you need to stream anything you want on your PC with full JRiver DSP, which is very powerful. So that's another side note. And that's it for this method, folks. If you want, you can also add crossover phase correction. It will only have positive effects. Do this before the inversion. And that's all. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Some very nice features are on the way. REW Beta recently started API integration. It's a work in progress, but opens doors to very, very exciting things that can be done. I'm working on fully automated, automated Odyssey calibration correction. With a click of a button, it will be possible now that we have the APIs. But as I said, it's a work in progress. It will take some more time and you will have to upgrade Rev to Pro, I guess, to use it, which I believe you should. In fact, for example, I'm also considering now, now, now that I have Pro, to use multiple microphones at the listening position to capture the directions of high frequencies and see what can be done about it. So that's it for today now, folks, and see you soon. Bye-bye.